You know, we've been doing a <coughs> storyboard thing, which has required me to, to kind of think back. Uh, uh, some things are easier to remember than others. But when I was thinking about what we want to talk about today, I had this thought. I was never really much into motorbikes. Cars, definitely, yes. Motorbikes, not really. But there was a little spell of involvement, I suppose, at one stage uh, in my life. Um, not much in, in driving them, but sometimes riding. And some of my friends had bikes. And uh, they had different, different ways and different styles. Now, Freddie Izzard, he had, he, he was very steady Freddie, and his bike was very comfortable, and it was, oh, you've got it, yeah, all right, uh, and it was kind of, yeah, take forever to get anywhere. Pete Hutchings, on the other hand, had the biggest, fastest bike, and was totally crazy. You kind of knew how he was going to end up. So on the day when he broke a four-inch square wooden post with his face, you weren't totally surprised. Uh, didn't really... Certainly nobody in their right mind used to ride with him. But then there was Jimmy Robinson. Jimmy Robinson, whose father was a speedway rider, and something of those genes were, were, were in him. And he was exciting to ride with. Uh, and I can remember a particular time of, of riding with him, riding down Hartford Hill. Uh, he was fast, he was adventurous, he was skilled. Uh, and you had to, if you were riding with him, uh, the term we used to use was pillion but do you, is that still used, pillion passenger? You still, yeah, yeah, the old people know the term. I don't know what it's called <laughs> now. But uh, If you're riding pillion with him, you had to kind of ride with him. You had to kind of uh, lean where he leant. You, when you'd feel you'd want to hang on and lean the other way, you had to really go with him. Otherwise, that would destroy the balance of the thing and the bike would crash. And I, I can remember one of the times and he said, good, good job you did what I told you to do. He said, we would never have made that, that turn, that bend, if you hadn't have done it. You just, it was so important and so critical. And I guess it really boils down to this thing of choosing to move together with the, with the one who is driving and in control. That's what I want to talk about today. But I want to do it in a different way. I want to talk a little bit, and then I want us to have opportunity to, to embrace what we're actually talking about and just see if God the Holy Spirit would uh, enable us to enter in, not just to the knowledge, but to the experience. Moving with the Holy Spirit. We're moving on in the... Uh, from the normal radical series, uh, because we, we've, I think we said before, we've reached a point where we, we need the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to show us, empower us, in order to live our lives as normal radicals. You know, this is not just some, a, a list of things we learn from a textbook. This is an experience that we learn as we walk with God. Very, very key, very important. So, in this... Next phase of the spirit of adventure, which you'll probably call adventuring with the spirit, uh, we want to see how God will bring kind of to life and to experience more of the things that we've been talking about. <coughs> but the key thing that we need to understand right from the word go is what we do is not as important as who we journey with. Right now, 
today. We have to come again to refresh our thinking in the fact that what we do and the exploits and the opportunities and things, that's all great, that's all fun. But the primary thing is who we're actually journeying with. So we're going to take a little bit of time to look at that. And as we do it, we're going to ask that Holy Spirit will, will minister to us the very things that we're talking about. What could that mean? If God the Holy Spirit actually ministers to us, could be. Some people will step out, deciding to risk things without having everything just already lined up and prepared. Could be that somebody will decide, you know what, there's a release here from worry and fear. Could be the other way around, that somebody receives wisdom, solution to issues or problems could be not to do with us just directly personally other than here's somebody who we could demonstrate God's love to what a great and wonderful privilege to actually bring to be a kind of carrier a transportation service of bringing something of the wonder and goodness of God to somebody else could be a new sense of urgency a new sense of uh, motivation for what God wants. We kind of know it. It's kind of in the background. It's sort of there, but it kind of brought to the foreground. It's like instead of being sometime, somewhere, one day, maybe, it suddenly comes into this place of now's the time, now's the moment, now's the opportunity. It could be that To be honest, you're not in a good place. Things have got on top of you. When the psalmist talks about about being brought up out of a horrible pit, you could identify with that. But what about a God who just doesn't say that's what he does, but you actually, in an adventure with the Spirit, experience that's what God is doing. And you testify I was in what seemed certainly to me a horrible pit and God brought me up by the power of his spirit. You know, for these things, we need something more than just knowing what God can do. We need something more than even knowing what the word of God says. We need God, the Holy Spirit, to impart and to to place something in us so that that which we know as a word or truth becomes applied and living and real to the point that we can take hold of it and say, yes, I receive that. You've heard it said. How many times have we heard people testify and we've said that's a a prophetic declaration and you've sat there and you say, yeah, you know what? I receive that for me. That's what we're looking. So there's three things that we want to just kind of briefly mention. Three things that we need to know about the Holy Spirit so that we can we can be like the pillion rider, so that we can we can actually ride uh, in concert with him. Uh, sometimes, you know, we're not the ability to see. You know, if you're riding pillion and you're wanting to have a good look at the bend and you start leaning around where the driver is so you can see the way ahead, you just wreck the balance right there. There's that place of, place of trust, place of commitment to who he is and what he will do. So let's remember, then first of all, I know something that we all know. The Spirit of God is a person and he comes to us personally. That's why we refer to him, not it. And that makes a difference understanding that. If if the spirit is an it or a function, 
is like a, like a tool that we have to utilise. It's like, here's what to do, now somehow we've got to do it. But if we're, if we're walking in concert with the person of the Holy Spirit, that's very different. That's not a list of instructions, and then we have to work it out. We catch the person, his heart, his feelings. It's not about yielding to a force, but submitting to a person. It's about a partnership with him, him obviously, always as a senior partner. It's about being engaged together in the outworking of God's purpose. It's the difference between dancing with a robot or dancing with a professional. That's the difference. Now, a while ago... Okay. Okay, don't worry about it. Uh, A while ago, uh, we were having... Dawn and I were having some dancing lessons. And uh, she discovered... She discovered that she could dance so well with the instructor. <laughs> and, and let me quickly say, that's not because he was younger or better looking or anything like that. But somehow, I could do it because I could remember, you know, this step and this. And I'm kind of thinking it in my head, following through the instructions. When she danced with the instructor... It just kind of became easy. See, it wasn't about following instructions. It was about engaging together with a person who could actually lead and help and direct. That's what we're talking about. That's why it's important that we we understand the person... How many already knew that? Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. Most of us. But how many of us actually act with that knowledge? I think, I'm not going to ask you, but I, I think most of us would kind of, when it comes to it, revert to the, the kind of external force idea rather than a person. And what God wants is that we engage with the Holy Spirit in a way which is about recognising that we pick up the feelings and the thoughts. Bill Johnson uh, said this. He said, uh, I urge you to read the scriptures from a posture of leaning into his voice. Kind of, catching more than just what he's what you're saying expectation has everything to do with what you receive from god rather than expecting to gain mere information answers to your questions or proof text to make a point listening to the voice of the spirit to take the words whether it's on a page or deposited into your hearing take it in a personal way, as a personal word, this is God speaking to me. This is not something that I'm reading, and yes, it's good, and isn't it wonderful, but this is God speaking to me. And when you hear it, it creates that distinctive resonating in your spirit that makes me say, wow, I might not know what that means, but yet it's so right. I can't explain it, I can't analyse it, but I feel the rightness of it. And then, once we do that, we begin begin to, to make that our declaration, rather than all the other things, which may describe more of the issue, more of the problem, more of the difficulties that we're facing, knowing God's word. See... We are called to enter into relationship with the Spirit. 
he is responsive to our needs. And this is what the Bible says. And this is, this is very, very significant personally. John, John 14, 17 tells us that he, the Spirit of God, lives in you and is with you. He lives in you and is with you. Can you just work with me a minute? Just say it to somebody. He lives in you and with you. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says in Acts 2 that it was like a, a rushing wind and a fire. But it's very interesting, uh, and looking at all the different translations, uh, it's like a kind of huge ball of fire or a, a huge tongue of fire. But the significant thing is that it kind of separated into separate tongues of flame onto each person, demonstrating the very essence that this is a personal thing. This is not just a general thing. This is personal. That God selects us in his purpose. You know, it would be a good... I said we're going to do this. So let's take a little time. Let's just take a little time now before God. Before we, we, before we go, there's no, no amount that we've got to cover. Just to invite him to come to us personally right now. Let's just bow our heads in prayer a minute. Lord, we just invite you now. Just come to us personally. That we just might know right now today, not just the teaching about it, but the experience of that personal encounter with you. Not the instructions, but the person. Not a list of do's and don'ts, but an experience of actually being together with you. Let's just worship him. There's a scripture in um, Hebrews 1 that said, in times past, if you bring it up, Hebrews 1 and 2, he said in times past, God spoke to us and the prophets in diverse ways, but now he's speaking to us by his son. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. You can have your seats. We'll just look at this quickly. Mm. We go to verse 1. Uh, it says, In the past, God spoke to us by the forefathers, through the prophets, and this came in many declarative words. And we know the stories of God speaking through the Elijah, the, the, you know, the Ezekiels of old. But when you go to verse 2, it says, he's speaking to us now through his son. And I think that's something that John just shared. And then John shared something in terms of the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring Christ to us. And that is so true. And he, you know, he shared it just as just as a, a small phrase, but once we could really understand the power of that person, of Jesus, and that glorious inheritance we have inside of the Holy Spirit, we could really come into an empowered life. As John said, we are riding pillion. It is not us who is riding the bike. It is not us who are called to live this life. We need to give ourselves as tools so that God through us could bring his glory and a lot of uh, John said something very interesting he captured it sometimes we want to look around the curve and kind of enjoy the ride or just be a functioning pillion rider at the back if you just bring up John 16 verse 
11 to 14. John 16. This is Jesus talking to disciples at the end of all the glorious miracles that we saw in the Gospels. And here he is in verse 12, he's saying, after all the miracles that they saw and all the wonders, he said, I have so much more to say to you, but you in your present form, you cannot bear it. He says, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. And he will guide you into all truth. But who he says he will guide you to talk about? He will not talk of himself, but he will only do what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. If you go to the next verse. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take you from what is mine and make it known to you. And it's almost like that whole teaching John just shared is almost wrapped up inside of that. If we are willing to follow the Spirit, He is the one who will bring us to know the power of this Son, which is Jesus. And here is Jesus also saying, everything that I am is my Father. So as we sing this song, turn our eyes upon Jesus, what we're really saying to God is, God, I want to discover you, who is at the end of it all. I will discover you by following the Spirit, and by following the Spirit, I will come to know this Jesus. This is what God is willing to take us to. All right, so as we sing it, we are committing ourselves to our blessed inheritance that is buried in this treasure that God has laid up for us. take your seats again or you can continue to stand it's up to you but when we come to God it's like this and we're desiring the presence that personal encounter I don't know if it ever happens like this to you but I is this me? Is, is this my emotions? Is this my thoughts? It's difficult to sort out. That's why I take refuge in the fact that it's the Spirit of God that searches us and, and convicts us. In Hebrews 4, it says that the Spirit of God, the Word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword, actually separating spirit and soul and feelings and emotions. You know, when we get to that place, I don't know what to think. We have the Spirit of God who actually enables us to, to home in on Him and what He's saying. goes on to say about actually separates these things and also knows the thoughts and intents of our heart you know there's a, there's a lot of stuff that can go through the mind and a lot of thoughts that can crowd in but we're talking about that person that person Spirit who can actually come to the very thoughts and intents of the heart, the very place where we'd want to be responding to Him, actually is able to deal with the, the real issues. You know, we get into kind of a lot of side issues at times, but, but to home in on the real issues, let's let Him do that. Let's let Him home in. If there's a barrier, if there's a blockage, if there's a particular emphasis, if there's something that he's wanting to say, let's come back to the pillion again. Now's the time to lean into this bend or to lean into that bend. 
Lord, I want to go where you want me to go. I'm yielding to you. And I'm inviting you who knows the thoughts and intents of my heart. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 that the Spirit of God searches all things, even the deep things of God. He knows what I'm likely to do. He knows what I need to do. And instructs accordingly. He knows how I am to be. He knows the attitude. He knows, he knows the response. I'm saying him searching is a safe place. It's a positive place. Do you remember after Peter had denied the Lord? He was in a desperate state. And after he'd risen from the dead, he sent a message. He said, go and tell my disciples that I've risen. He says, go and tell my disciples and mentions Peter by name. He says, go tell my disciples and Peter. Because he knew what was happening in Peter. He knew how Peter had disqualified himself. He knew how desperate Peter was feeling, having let down in such a dramatic way. Go and tell my disciples and Peter. You see, our God is able to enter into the very area of our feelings. You know, what an amazing thing for the one who knows even our thoughts and intents for somebody who fully knows us and yet fully loves us. Knows everything, good, bad and indifferent and yet fully loves us. Now, that, that's a searching, not for his sake, but for our sake. You know, Jamie was telling me a story about how some point his life I'd observed a certain characteristic that I encouraged him in that he would have otherwise wanted to kind of resist how much more is the spirit of God able to bring forth let's let him have his way The Bible tells us in John 16 that it's the work of the Spirit to convict of sin and righteousness. That's why it's not a good job for us to try and do it. We're not equipped for that. It's His work. Search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God. It's a very, very good prayer. It's a very safe prayer. See, in these days in the world in which we live, we think of searching like a going through security at the airport. Either being frisked or standing in one of those machines that does a search. It's a kind of intrusive thing. And it's not for us. But we're talking about the Spirit of God that, that searches in the way that the Scripture says. That searches for our sakes to bring forth what He wants. To bring conviction where it's necessary. Because with conviction there's always a way through. If we do it, we try to get into a condemnation and think about how useless and how hopeless doesn't search us to humiliate us he searches us to restore us into what he's already ordained for us searching for our God so he knows where we're dry
there's a, a line of this song which we may, we may use about the power of his love the weaknesses in me will all be swept away in the power of his love as we continue to worship let's just use that use the words of that as we invite and you only you can do this invite him to come and search you we've already taken the opportunity to invite him to come to us personally now now we're going to invite him to come and search us do you want to do that? only you can do it I can't do that for you but we're today seeking not just to hear things but actually to respond to the things we're going to ask God to do what actually do the very things that he is talking to us about today it's a powerful prayer Hold me close. Let your love surround me. Weaknesses that I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. See, this searching as we just said it's not to expose and humiliate it's to release and set free when we were praying before the meeting we had a word about a very dark place but there was a doorway that was a source of light I found that interesting because earlier in the day I had a picture of a very dark place and a pinprick of light. I believe the Lord would say, for those who say, in order as you search me, you know I'm in a dark place. And he's saying, yeah, but there's a, there's a source of light. There's a place where the light can come in. There's a pinprick. And that pinprick is the power of my love the power of the Holy Spirit that everything else can be stripped away and removed as you focus on my person say Lord I don't know I don't understand I don't have the answers everything seems black everything seems without much hope so I turn to you I choose to say, you, Lord, search me out. You, Lord, find me. You, Lord, bring me up out of a pit. You, Lord, direct my ways. You, Lord, even direct my thinking and my attitude. I choose to ride pillion with you all over again. that we have to avail ourselves of his search and so we we sort through by his power by his grace and allow him to bring forth what he wants but he also leads and guides us John 16 says he guides us into all truth guides us away from the deceit, from the lies, from the false accusations. Many of you would understand 
what it is when the enemy starts and piles one thing on top of another and the weight seems to get heavier and the blackness seems to get more intense it begins to affect the whole being at levels of almost hopelessness and despair but he guides us into all truth which means he guides us away from the lies away from the false accusations into the reality that he is with us and in us into the place where he can search out as we say Lord I stand before you and invite you to have full control guides us into all truth and what a wonderful assurance in Romans 8 sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So many of the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. It's a promise. It's an unbreakable promise. It's the promise of the King that He will lead us because we're sons daughters of the living God. But comes back to the motorbike. I have to submit to the one who steers and is in control. I have to trust that he can not only navigate the bends, but when we come to the junction at the bottom, he can break in time. My life is in his hands. I have to go his way. When I feel the bike leaning, I have to lean with it. I have to take his his attitude. If he decides to go faster, if he decides this is the time when we're going to get this machine faster than ever before, I'm submitting to that. Let's respond to him. Say yes. We decide to trust you to take full control. We say your kingdom come. Your will be done. All I would need is is my assignment in this. We choose to seek first the kingdom of God. Not, Not things, not stuff, but the kingdom of God. What do you want? And we recognize that all that are called according to his purpose. promises everything will work out just great according to those that are called according to his purpose this is Romans 8.29 from the message God knew what he was doing from the very beginning he decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in line of humanity he restored. We see the original intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. Calling people by name. Called you by your name. Daniel and Daniel, he called you by your name. Charlotte, he called you by your name. Beck, he called you by your name. Lucy, I see you there. He called you by your name. And the good news is, he called Gordon as well. (laughs) God made that decision of what his children should be like. He followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun Take a moment to hold up before God. Somebody that's not here, 
So you are asking on their behalf that God would search them, search them out. Name them before God right now. That person that's coming to your mind is not here. You need God to search them in the way that we've been talking about God the Holy Spirit searching. That they would come out of the darkness into that light in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Moments of time. Moments of time when God speaks into situations. You're having a conversation. And all of a sudden, it moves to a whole different level. Maybe for a sentence. Maybe for a question. That's God searching out. That's God, the Holy Spirit, taking the control. Directing it where it should go. We surrender and choose to go with him. believe God's put amongst us some real fighters, some that have fought for their families, some that have fought against illness, some that have fought against injustice. And you've worn yourself out with this fighting. You're ragged and torn. You won't let go. I believe God would say to you this morning submit yourself to me it's time to stop fighting it's time to stop fighting let me have your, my way submit yourself to me for God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble he who God humbles he will lift up Lord, we, we don't want to fight your battles. Hallelujah. Lord, we believe that you will contend with those who contend with us. Hallelujah. We want to, to know that you are on our side and to be fighting with your strength, following your lead, leaning with you as you take those bends. Lord, we would repent of every false move, every every tur- turn that we've taken that's been wrong. And Lord, we would want to follow your lead. Yes. Hallelujah. Just surrendering to him. Thank you, Lord. Just surrendering into his will, his purpose. It's a word that's just... I perceive God is telling some people not to be hard in themselves, but to surrender to him and let go, to know I love, compassion and great mercy. Stop blaming yourself for what has happened. It's not your fault. Lean on the power of freedom. It's a wonderful thing. But there's a place in God that we can turn even if we feel that we're culpable in something we can still turn and receive his love and his forgiveness I know the children are coming back in let's just take that song once more stand in awe let's stand together you know you may have come to the conclusion that you don't know Jesus that you're not a follower of Jesus While we're singing this song, we'd love to pray with you that God would reveal himself in the very person of the Holy Spirit. This is not about a doctrine, not about a religion, not about a belief system. It's about an experience of meeting the person of the living God. So if you want prayer... If you'd like to say, yes, I want to know that. Then as we sing this song, you can come and stand here and we'll pray with you.